All right. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'vracha. The clock makes the same sounds all day. But we hear it differently. Depends what's going on. Like you're a lawyer, so you hear it one way. Clock, time, every second has a different sound. The morning, the evening. And uh, what time do we light the Meneira? Light the Meneira when it gets dark. So on the surface, we're lighting the Meneira when the world is going down. The world is getting darker. That's when we light the Meneira. But the Rebbe put it this way. He says, instead of looking at the darkness as something that puts you down, what does a Jew say when he sees that it's starting to get dark at, at, at night? On Hanukkah. He says, oh, finally, now I can light the Meneira. Instead of looking at the darkness as a, as a, as a something, something that depresses you, the Jew says, oh, here's my chance to shine. Here's an opportunity for me to do something. This is my, my time to give my light. Hashem has opened up something for me to give my light here. This is, this is a place that I have to come and, and add something to. Hashem has opened up a space for me to add my light. It's for me. The um, unusual quality of the mitzvah Manera, different than all their mitzvahs, is in, is in a couple of aspects, but I want to focus on one tonight. Menorah is different than all their mitzvahs in a few ways, but one of them is like this. All their mitzvahs are, are all in one shot. For example, mitzvah of Luvah and Esrik. You can't say, I'm going to buy a Luvah today, and tomorrow I'll get the Esrik, and then I'll get the Myrtles, and then I'll get the Willows, and then all together I'll have a mitzvah of Luvah and Esrik after a couple of days. You have to get the whole thing at once. Judaism is all, all at once. If there's a critical component to a mitzvah, if you don't have a component, then the mitzvah is not a mitzvah. You have a, you have tefillin. Boys come becoming bar mitzvah. You don't say, oh, I'll get them the hand tefillin, then I'll get them the head tefillin. You get the tefillin. Tefillin is tefillin. But here at Hanukkah, the whole formula, the whole system of how the menorah is done is step by step. Day one, you light one candle. Day two, you light two candles. Now tonight's the night, third night of Hanukkah. We light three candles. Why? Why is it done in this way? As the Pnei Yeshua asks, he says it should be every day, eight candles. Every day should be eight. Why? Uh, I made the same mistake, by the way. I got a Carmen era, and I was thinking, oh, you know, I don't have to, I'm not going to make myself crazy every day to switch the bowl. I'll just put the all eight every night. You know, I don't have to worry about people get the mistake of which night of Hanukkah. It just looks night, brighter with eight candles on my Carmen era, and the whole thing shorted right away. <laughs> so... So now I don't have any candles. But anyway, so the question is, why is it that we specifically do this mitzvah in a gradual way, step by step, and we don't do it all at once like every other mitzvah? There's an argument, famous argument, between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel, Beisham, Beisillel, of the order of how to light the menorah. Beishamai says in day one of Hanukkah, light eight candles, and this. Hanukkah goes on, you light less and less. Ms. Hillel says that they want of Hanukkah light one candle, each day you add one more. So of course, Beis Shammai is hard to understand. Why go less and less? In, Ju- in general, in Judaism, we're told, Mylon Bakodesh, you're always supposed to increase, always supposed to go get better and better, and do more and more. So why would Beis Shammai say to go less and less every day? And even Beis Hillel says to go step by step, more and more, if you're going towards light, just do all the light. Why, why do we have this thing of, of progressively adding in light? When just on the last day of Hanukkah, what's the last day of Hanukkah called? The last day of Hanukkah is called Zos Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah. What well, wasn't Hanukkah well, before Hanukkah? Before the last day of Hanukkah it was like Tisha B'av. This only the last day of Hanukkah is called Hanukkah. Before what? It's not Hanukkah. So we can't call it fully Hanukkah till you have all eight candles shining. So, so start off with eight candles. Why, why do you have to start off with one and add progressively? The Marasha, by the way, says that Beishamai agrees with the premise of Beishil, you have to add consecutively, add, in general in Judaism, you have to add more and more, but he says the reason why you have to decrease is because we learn this from the bulls of Yantif. The bulls of Yantif? What are you talking about? There's a lot, the, the Torah says that on Sukkot, oh, on Sukkot every day we bring sacrifices all together we bring 70 bulls that correspond to 70 nations of the world. And every day of, of Sukkot, 
we bring less and less bulls on the altar. So Beishamai says, just like on Sukkot, we bring less and less bulls on the altar, so to on Hanukkah, we should light less and less candles. What's the connection? Bulls on the altar are less, therefore the candles should be less. What, what's the relationship between the bulls on the altar and candles of Hanukkah? What's, what's, what's the connection? And, and over there also, what's the idea of, of the bulls being less and less? And the bulls, it's, it's from the Torah, right? It's the Torah passage. itself says it, yeah. So what does this mean? So, one explanation is like this. One explanation is that, it's like, let's say you, just on the surface, just going back in history for a second, what in general is this, why are we focusing on the candles of Hanukkah in the first place? Seemingly, the main miracle of Hanukkah, there's a four-year war, and there were so many miracles throughout the four years that the Jewish people are battling against the Greeks. Four years of miracles. Imagine if us over here in the shul, we decide to leave the shul and we're going to take on the LAPD. You know, we, uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to take them on. That's the kind of odds that were with the Jewish people against the Greeks. It, it wasn't like the, their, their guerrilla warfare and they had this unique system. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was impossible, totally impossible from the outside. It, was, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even connected to the realm of possibility. And four years, there's four years of, of miracles after miracle, and, they, and they're victorious, and they finally come and they build and they come back in the temple and they, and they find one jar of oil, and they light the menorah, and the menorah lasts for, for eight days. What's the main thing that happened? The main thing on the surface is that they won the war. Let's compare this to the three, two other times that the Jewish people were saved, we have a celebration from victory over our enemies. We celebrate on uh, Passover, we were redeemed from the Greeks, from the Egyptians, excuse me. And how do we celebrate? We eat. How do we celebrate when on Purim we were saved from Haman? We eat. So Hanukkah, it would seem we should follow the same thing. And instead we focus on these candles, the candles, the candles, light them at a candle. Everyone has to light a candle. Everyone should do it. And this, is, by the way, it's a magical thing. It's unbelievable. Um, when you give a Jew a menorah, it doesn't matter who the Jew is, it's something that it strikes something right away. I, I find that, that, that a menorah of all the mitzvahs in the Torah... I find that a menorah specifically lights up a person's neshama faster than other mitzvahs. Um, I, this is something I've seen personally. So you give a Jew a menorah and, and it resonates. Like, oh, I, I did that. As people have never heard of this before. I give a Jew a menorah, you let the menorah, he's like, I don't know what this is, Rabbi, but this is special. This was special. This was special. They don't know why. The Rebbe once said, actually, the reason why it's so special is because the menorah is connected to the miracle of oil. And in Kabbalah, it says that oil has to do with the secrets of the secrets, the deepest secrets of the Torah. And... Not, and the menorah has to do with the miracle of the oil. So it has to do with, with the revelation of the deepest secrets of the Torah in a miraculous way. So even though the Jew has no idea what he's doing when he's lying, when he's lying that menorah, but he's getting something. He's getting a revelation of the innermost parts of Torah into his soul. And therefore, it, it's, therefore it, it, it makes a difference. Anyway, so... so um, but why is it that we focus on the candles when on other holidays the focus is the food? You know, they saved us, we eat. That's a Jewish thing. And here, they saved us. Okay, we have we have latkes and we have uh, sufganiyot, but that's not officially a mitzvah, that's just a custom. That's why some people could say, yeah, you don't have to eat so many of them because it's just a custom. Wouldn't it be great if it was a mitzvah to have like five latkes every day and five sufganiyot? You feel so much better about the five. How many you had today? I, I, I only had two, Baruch Hashem. Anyways, but, but uh, instead you feel bad. Like every time you have one, you're like, ah, I shouldn't have. Or it's a holiday, I'll have another one. But wouldn't it be great if it was a mitzvah? But it's not a mitzvah. Why isn't it a mitzvah? I don't some people feel bad on <laughs> So the reason it's a, a other holidays are different, according to the other opinions, is that the, the, there it was an, uh, there's a difference between the miracle of Hanukkah to the miracle of Passover and the miracle of Purim. And that is, the other holidays there was a threat to the Jewish people, and the miracle was the Jewish people were saved, their bodies were saved. There was a physical victory, and therefore it's celebrated with a physical meal. Our bodies were saved, our lives were saved. So we celebrate by eating, by a physical celebration. We're celebrating our lives, therefore we eat. But on Hanukkah, the threat wasn't against the Jewish body. The threat was against Judaism. The threat was against the Jewish soul. The threat was about eradicating and removing from our, ourselves our belief in God. The Greeks weren't about destroying Jerusalem. The Greeks came into Jerusalem, and they said, oh, great, let's, and they renamed Jerusalem Antuchia. 
and uh, Antiochus, he went into the temple and he wanted to make it a, a place of worship for a Zeus or whatever, and he wanted not to destroy the Jewish body. Jews, let the, Jews, have, Jews have their culture, we have culture like Smith, that's mixed cultures. We, we say famously in the al prayer, the Greeks wanted us to forget your Torah. They weren't against Torah. They love Torah. You have ideas, we have ideas. It's great. They were only against your Torah. They were against the fact that we were, we were so bent on focusing on the divine element in Torah, the holiness in Torah. And that's also the reason why they contaminated all the uh, oil in the temple. In Kabbalah, oil is wisdom. What the Greeks wanted to do was to give us the message and to inculcate in our psyche, into our lifestyle, into our culture, that Torah isn't holy. That the oil that we have isn't holy oil. We have, we, we have a philosophy just like they do. And the miracle was that one jar of oil was left. And that, that one jar of oil that was left represents that the essence of the soul, the essence of our neshama, always knows the truth. The one jar of oil that was left represents the fact that deep down, a Jew knows the truth, a Jew knows what it's all about. Although on the outside there's a confusion and there's great darkness and it's so dark that even the temple is dark and the temple's oil is gone. But that represents like, like how the darkness of the, of, the, of the Greeks has reached even to the temple. Even the highest levels of holiness were contaminated. But the highest wasn't. The essence of the soul is, can never be contaminated. Anyway, so, so the, that's why the focus of Hanukkah, according to most opinions, according to Halacha, isn't on the food because it's not a physical celebration. It's a spiritual one. The decree was not against the Jewish body, against the Jewish, Jewish soul. And therefore, the celebration is also by saying an extra prayer, saying the halal, and lighting the menorah. Lighting the menorah to celebrate the, the miracle of the oil, the miracle of the nesham. Okay. So, how many candles should we light? So the miracle is, we're celebrating the... Uh, people are complaining, I'm not looking at the camera. Okay, I'm not looking at the camera. Sorry, guys. Hi. All right, so... Um, uh, why we celebrate? Why do we light one candle, then add a second candle, then a third candle? And according to Beishamai, why eight candles then go down? So one way of looking at it is that it's co- sort of like the actual event that happened. Beis Hillel says, "Look at this. Day one, the Jewish people come back and they they they, they clean out the temple from all the all the gunk that was in it, that the Greeks left over. And now it's time to light the menorahs. So before there was a beautiful golden menorah." They had some brass, metal, monera, whatever they used to light the monera. They, they couldn't afford to have a beautiful golden monera. And they lit light the monera. And the monera lasts till the next day. So the next day, it's, the word spreads. How far does it spread? Well, then by one day, it's, it's, the miracle is out there. Everyone hears about this. It's amazing. But it doesn't get spread that far. Then there's WhatsApp groups get it. Once the WhatsApp groups get it, then, you know, then, 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 then it starts going really wild. It goes viral. By day three or four... We have the whole television and the newspapers. Everyone's talking about this miracle. The miracle is getting greater and greater day by day. Everyone, the whole world, it's spreading farther and farther every day. So the miracle is getting greater. I mean, it's lasting longer, but it's also becoming more publicized every day. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, one second, the Jews come to the, to, to the temple. They can't find any oil. They find one jar of oil. How much could that oil last for? So they thought that this oil could last for one day. So what did they do? What did they actually do when they took that? They had that one cruise of oil. What did they do with it? They pour the whole thing in. So actually, the that's a rush and brings two opinions. One opinion is they took this jar of oil and they poured into the menorah only an eighth, only one eighth of uh, the oil, and miraculously God changed the quality of that oil, and instead of it, instead of it lasting for uh, just a few hours, it lasts for all eight hours till the morning. So they knew on day one. It's only going to be eight day celebration. Well, they had to get, they knew it would take them eight days to get new oil. So they only poured in one eighth because they, they, uh, want, they want to do something for the next day until they got the pure oil. So they poured in one eighth, but they didn't know it was going to last a whole night. They poured in just an eighth, a little bit, so they'd have something for all eight days. But seeing that the miracle happened on day one, they could only expect the miracle to, to, to continue the same way that it started. And therefore, there'll only be eight days left of the miracle. So they have only eight days left to watch this phenomenon. There's only eight days left in the miracle. On day one, there's only eight days left. Let's say you, you win uh, um, $10 million. It's great, no? It's, not bad. it's better than, than nine, for sure. <clears throat> Anyways, you win $10 million. So, and then you start spending it. 
start spending it. So one way, you say you buy a house, you buy a boat, you buy a yacht, and you buy this, and you buy that, and you've used it, and you buy more and more, it's great. That's one way of looking at it. That's the way your uh, rabbits might look at it. That's the way you're, but, but you're looking at, oh my gosh, I only have $5,000 left. I had 10 million, now I have five, uh, less and less and less and less. One way of looking at it is how much was used. Another way of looking at it is how much is left. So Beishamai says, let's look at how much was, uh, how much is left. Beishamai says, let's look at the impact of this miracle. Let's, have, let, look, let's look at the, at, at the practical effect of the miracle. That's what, that's what we explain in the peripheral way, but it's actually deeper than that. Um, Beishamai says, look at the potential of the miracle. Beishil says, look at the practical miracle. Look at that. Look, look, look at how much is actually left. Actually, and this is in the whole entire Talmud. Beis Shammai still always disagree about potential and actual. Beis Shammai always gravitates to look at the potential of things, and Beis Hillel there's many arguments between them, and the Rebbe always explains our argument to be centered around this potential and actual. Uh, so Beis Shammai says, "Well, there's only potential for eight days." Beis Hillel says, "Well, there's a, one day that happened for one day, it happened for two days, it happened for three days. Look at what actually happened." But why did they? But what's What's, what's the underlying reason behind their argument? Where does it come from? We know the famous story of the convert that comes to Shammai. He says, Con- convert me to Torah on condition, I want to become a Jew, on condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. So what does Shammai do? Shammai says, are you crazy? And he chases him out, this is impossible. He comes to Hillel, and Hillel says to him, oh, you want to convert to Judaism? Let me tell you. What's hateful unto you, don't do it to anybody else. That's the whole Judaism. So it sounds like Hillel was a very nice guy, and Shammai wasn't a nice guy. And the nice guy, Hillel, made to help the non-Jew discover Judaism, and the not nice guy, the mean guy, Shammai, chased him away. That's what it sounds like. And the Talmud actually continues, the Talmud says three stories, and the conclusion of the three stories is that all these three converts met together, and they said it's because of the humility and the kindness of Hillel that we all merited to enter under the wings of the Divine Presence, under the wings of the Shekhinah. But Shammai wasn't a mean person. On the contrary, the Talmud says about Shammai that he was the one who said, he was the author of the statement, whenever you meet somebody, you should smile. So Shammai says, whenever you meet somebody, you should greet them with a, with a good face. So Shammai wasn't missing anything in kindness. He was, he was the one who authored in the Torah. How do we know in the Torah that you should greet someone with a smile? It's Shammai who said that. And yet Shammai was the one who also told this guy not to leave. Why did he tell him to leave? The difference in the school of thought of Shammai and Hillel could possibly be explained in the following way. The Rabbi Zevin writes that when the uh, Jews came to light the menorah, they, uh, the, the, what were they actually doing? There's two different things they had to do. One thing they had to do was to get rid of all the negative stuff that the Greeks had left. And the other is that they're bringing the, light, the, the holiness back into the world. That they get rid of the negative and they're bringing the positive. So they brought in, they brought in fire. Let's say, you have something, let's say you have something in your life that's a big challenge for you. Let's say you're attracted to something you shouldn't be attracted to, and you want to stop. How do you stop? So, if you want to stop gradually, it's very hard to stop gradually. Usually, if it's something that's, 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 uh, that ha- has a very deep and strong attraction, the only way to stop is cold turkey. To stop cold turkey, you've got to use all of your energy, all of your fire, all of your passion and say, I want to stop, and I want to stop now. And you stop. You stop and you abstain from uh, whatever, you, whatever you're not supposed to have, if it's latkes or, or something worse than that. So day one is very hard. How's day two? Day two is a little bit easier. Because you already stopped for a day. Day three is even easier. Day four is even easier. Once you, you need all of your fire, of your power to stop on day one. But on day two, you don't need all that fire. Day two, it's easier. And that's what Beishamai says. In order to, to burn out the, the impurity of the, of the Greeks, they needed all of the, the fire on day one. That's why he says the first day is eight candles. And after that, it goes less and less. And, you know, it gets easier and easier. That's one way of, of, of dealing with the negative. What does Beishil say? 
So, so also with the, with the, with the convert, but Shammai wasn't saying like I, we don't accept converts. But Shammai was saying I want to have authentic, real converts. How long get the authentic? You want to be a Jew? You want to you, you want to really make it? You want to become under the wings of the Shechina? So then ma- make a move. Do something that's hard for you. Pull away yeah. something. Tear away yourself from what you're used to. Don't be satisfied where you are. There is a uh, Chabad lecturer. Her name is Mrs. Bronya Schaefer. Amazing, amazing lecturer. She speaks on women's topics throughout the world. And uh, the way she got into it is very interesting. Her husband was, was a very gifted speaker. And one time he couldn't make it because he wasn't feeling well. He told his wife, you try, you speak. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how she got into it. Anyways, so, um, so what happened was, she, she does all, all these different classes all over the world. And you know when you, when you speak and do all these classes... You, you wonder if you ever make an impact on someone. So she once got an amazing response to one of her classes. What happened was that the Rebbe's secretary called her. The Rebbe's secretary uh, showed her a letter and, a, and a, um, a Shabbos candle holder. Well, where is this from? What was the letter? There was a... Uh, she, she had... I don't remember which city this story took place. She gave a lecture. And uh, what happened was, there was a woman that attended the lecture that was married to a non Jew. And, uh, and she was very, um, very unsatisfied in her life. And she thought maybe religion could possibly satisfy her. So her husband told her, okay, let's try something. So they went to a Reformed temple, didn't speak to her, she didn't like it. Okay, it didn't work. So I was going to say to her, you know, so this next Sunday, we'll try the church. We tried a Jewish thing, didn't work, let's try the church. So she said, okay. And before going to the church, she had someone invite her to this lecture. Oh, she read the newspaper. She read the newspaper that there's this lady coming to give a lecture. She went to the lecture, and she hears the lecture, and, and she goes over to Mrs. Schaefer after the lecture, and she says to her, you know, I, I'm married to a non-Jew, and i um, married for many years. And I want to, I want to, I'm missing meaning in my life. So what did Mr. Schaefer say to her? Try this one thing. Tomorrow, light Shabbos candles. Try this out. Okay. So she lights the Shabbos candles. And she loves it. And she tells her husband, I don't need to go to the church. I got something. She lights Shabbos candles. And she stayed married to him. She lived and lived and lived for many weeks and months and years afterwards. And she, and she passed away. And, uh, a, a letter comes from her husband to the Rebbe Secretariat. Her husband tells the uh, Rebbe that um, she was, he was going to bury his wife in the Christian cemetery. Well, where else? That's where he's going to get buried. That's where she should get buried too. But he's about he's, he's, he's making the calls to arrange for a funeral. He looks on the on the dining room table and he sees her candlestick, candle holder. Like, this is what she always did. This is what she loved. This is who she really was. I'm going to put her by the goyim. So he called the uh, the rabbi that took care of the old age home, whatever, and he, he, gave her, he gave her a Jewish burial. And he said, I didn't know what to do with the mezuzah and with the candlesticks. I'm, she told, she, I remember she told me how she was inspired by this traveling speaker who said she was from Chabad. So I decided to send this back to you. And so here's the, her candlestick. And, so think about Mrs. Schaefer meeting this woman who was married to this non-Jew. She could have said to her, in a more shamai tone, what are you doing with your life? You, we know why you don't find any meaning in your life? Because you're married to a guy. <laughs> Get rid of the guy, and then we'll talk about meaning in your life. Let's so make a move. Tear yourself away from, from what you're... What, what, but she didn't. She said, bring light. Now, when you want to bring light into someone, the way to bring light is always gradual. Light always comes in slowly. If you want to tear yourself away from evil... So then, so then it takes, a, it takes a lot of energy day one, and it gets less and less in day two and three. But if you want to bring light in someone's life, if you want to, it, it, it's a gradual thing. It's step by step. You have to first do one small thing, and this is, and it's very hard. But you need a lot, you need a lot of patience to do this. You see something, you know, your child. You found out that your child uh, put a whoopee cushion under the teacher's, uh, you know, uh, what well, seat. You know, it's 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 a uh, what are you going to do? You, you, you tell your child, well, that was great, you did that today, and tomorrow, I want you to bring a stink bomb to, to, to collect. <laughs> you, you, you have to, but, but the truth is, is that uh, 
even when you're giving criticism, you have to find a way to bring out the child's good dignity. On the Hanukkah, I shared this story a few weeks ago. The the first time that the Hanukkah menorah was lit in Washington by Rabbi Shemtiv, uh, Jimmy Carter came. President Jimmy Carter comes to the menorah lighting, and I heard that he was in seclusion for a long time before the menorah lighting. Anyways, it comes. There's a lot of terrible things that are happening then, the hostage crisis, whatever. And he tells Rabbi Shemtiv, you know, it was the fourth night of Hanukkah. Lit four candles, and he was very excited. And after lighting them with the four candles, Rabbi Shemta tells the orchestra to begin the, the, the Hanukkah song. And the president, was like, oh, one second, one second. You forgot the other four. So he explains to him, yes, there's four because tonight's the fourth night of Hanukkah. I'm like, four candles. But Jimmy Carter's like, no, 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 you got a light. Oh, I want all full light. Shouldn't just have half the light. Let's get all the light tonight. I want, I need it. So Rabbi Shanta said, all right. <laughs> and they lit all eight candles that night. And the Rebbe was told about this. And the Rebbe, how the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe responded critically. But how, listen to the criticism the Rebbe said. The Rebbe said, from you I expected more Jewish pride. I expected more, more Jewish pride from you. So on the one hand, it was the Rebbe pushing him down, he was lifting him up. On the one hand, Rebbe is saying to him, I expect him more. I expect him more from you. But I know that I sent you to Washington. I know you have Jewish pride. I know you could do this. So even while the Rebbe is criticizing him, he's still validating. I know you're the guy. I know you're the one who could do it. Same, same as also with a parent to a child. When you tell the child, you're a chutzpanyak, you are insolent, you're not... The child says, okay, so you always try to be what, what, you, what you are. So if I'm insolent and if I'm hopeless, then let me be. Let me, let me focus on what I'm good at. So I'll be. I'll be chutzpah. But if you, if you appeal to the child's dignity and you tell the child, you, you, you know who you are. You know. You know. You know what, what I think about you. You know what kind of good heart I know you have. What kind of good mind you have. You build up the child, and you need a lot of patience because, because in order to, when you do that, things happen pretty slow, step by step by step. You build the child up. The beautiful teaching, of Shubin Prachia, said. You should judge every person favorably. Come on, judge them favorably. I'm so sorry about welcome, welcome. Um, there's another minion not here, not here. No. You guys already davened. I didn't daven. Oh, okay. You you davened? You davened? Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I'll be happy to come there in like five ten minutes. Thank you guys so much. So, um, so what happens is, is that. Uh, When you tell the child how wonderful, oh, Rishon Prachi says, judge every person favorably. Be realistic. You're a lawyer, right? You know, you know, you know how to figure out what things are happening. Things that the guy is off. When you judge him favorably, he, he did it. He did it. Doesn't mean that you're naive. It means look at the person, look at the goodness in the person. Also, the couple, the couple sometimes, husband and wife, they're getting into issue after issue. One one way of the Shami way of looking, looking at it is. Well, what, you tell the what, what are you doing this wrong? You have to come home earlier. You have to do this. You have to do that. Other way is, when you guys ever have fun together, why don't you do, do something positive together? It brings some light into light into the situation, and you need a lot of patience because it doesn't things don't happen overnight. When you're trying to add light, things go one. The day one is one candle. Day two is two candles. Day three is three candles. Even when you're critical, like in the story of the Rebbe, the Rebbe is finding a way to. I expect it more from you because you have so, so, so much inside. So this is the power and the lesson of the Meneira, that the, on the, we have one lesson from Shammai. When you're trying to turn away from evil, you need a lot of power in day one. And a lesson from Hillel, that the, the halacha is, that you don't have to focus on tearing away from evil. Instead of, like, like in the story of Mr. Schaefer, focus on adding good. I want to conclude with one amazing story you might have heard before. Rabbi uh, Moshe Brisky, uh, he was giving a, a class about faith. Uh, Moshe Brisky from Agora, and uh, there was a the cantor from the Reform Choir was attending this class, and he was very emotional. He started, and he was like like tearing up in the class on faith. He was surprised at what he went over to him, what's going on. And he told him like this. He says, "I want to tell you why I'm alive today." He said, "I uh, I lost I lost a child in a car accident." 
And because I, he had two daughters, I lost one of them in the car accident. Actually, I'm sorry, he lost two daughters in the car accident. He had, a, he had a third daughter. He lost two daughters in the car accident. So after the car accident, I was so depressed and broken that that affected my marriage and eventually got divorced. After I got divorced, so I felt like my life is over and I should just commit suicide. So I went to... Uh, I, was, I took my daughter to a movie. I figured this way, I'll take my eight-year-old daughter out, the third daughter that's still alive, I'll take her out to a movie, and, and then after the movie, I'll, I'll commit suicide. So I went to the movie, some place in Simi Valley, and I've got the name of the, name of the mall, and at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, uh, as I'm walking into the, into the movie theater, I'm online, I hear this, this, this singing, and there's music, and, there's, and I could tell, you get a musical ear. It's a Jewish music. What's Jewish music in the middle of this? No, in the middle of nowhere in Simi Valley. And he, and he goes over to the music and, and, and he's watching the menorah lighting. And, you know, Chabandik, they see someone on the side who's like, looks a little interested. They grab the guy and they bring him, they brought me into the circle and they started dancing with me. And, and, uh, and, and I felt good. And I felt like, and I saw my daughter smiling at me. My mother started, started taking pictures of me. And I felt like, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is special to her. You know what the custom is, you put the picture on Facebook, etc. So, so, so she, she felt how special it was, and, and he said, you know, I, I, just for her sake, I'm not going to kill myself. Right, Brisky so said to him, I'll tell you the other half of the story. So we had a Fabrengen, Yutas Kislev. By the Fabrengen, we decided we're going to add one more menorah, public menorah lighting this year. We're going to add a new place, new location we'd had before. We had an A, B, and C, we we'll add one more. Where should we add another place? I don't know. How about Simi Valley? So they called up the operator in Simi Valley, um, number to the mall. Which mall? So he didn't know which mall. So like, whatever, you tell. <laughs> so, so she just talked, so you mean this mall? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. All right, that mall had me going out of business. And all the stores are closed. The only thing that wasn't closed in the mall was the movie theater. The whole mall's been going out of business. So when we got to the mall, he said, I felt like we wasted our time. We, no one's, the whole thing is, so then I see, well, there's at least the movie theater. We set them there up in front of the movie theater. And he showed him a picture of that guy dancing with him by the movie theater years before. That's what kept him alive. I, I lied to people. People, the neshama, Jewish souls awake. You bring light in, and neshama responds. Tonight's the third night of Hanukkah. It'd be a great thing. Tonight, find another Jew. Let's have a menorah. Light his fire. Light his candle. And uh, let's tip the scale and bring Mashiach. Chaim, chaim, v'rach.